Happy Sabbath, church, once again. I want to take this time to once again thank our God for his amazing and matchless grace. And to thank him for each one of you. Thank you for the journey of the 40 days of prayer. Um, I am glad the Lord has carried us through. Um, uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us as we embark on this year. Um, every time that second ticks on the clock, every hour that drives by, every sunset is one that draws us closer to the fulfillment of the promise of Christ that he's coming back again. With that promise comes the urgency of the times that we're living in. Recognizing who we are in these times in the broad context of the tapestry of the world that has presented to us. How we functioning as God's children. That is why as Edmondson Heights when as a family whenever the new year begins we begin together in prayer it doesn't end at the 40 days of prayer it just kicks us off into a year of seasonal prayer and i pray that uh, not only with your prayers be answered but you will experience the depth of a relationship with god that you've not experienced before You'll experience growth in the way that you've not experienced before. You will face challenges. That is the nature of life. There will be trials and tribulation because the way of the cross requires that we go through our Gethsemanes and through our cro bear our crosses. We will have that because that's part of the, you know, of, of, of the journey that God has designed for us so that we can ultimately make it to a land where we don't have to worry about all these things that we are going through. I don't know how it is to live without worry. I don't know how to live without anxiety. I don't have to live with no, not knowing how to look over my back if my life is not threatened. I don't know how to live without the threat of sickness around the corner. I don't because I have not experienced that. But one thing I have seen and have experienced with the eye of faith is that God has promised all these things. And when that moment comes, when we sit by the tree of life, and when we gather together and drink from the river of life, the Bible says there will be joys untold. Not only will we be in heaven where heaven is now, heaven is where God dwells, not only will we be there where the Bible says the journey will take seven days to get to, that seven days, you calculate seven days at the speed of light. How fast does light travel? Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. You calculate how far that is. But the thousand years that we'll spend with our God as he continues to not only allow us to see the justification of those who are there, but why we are there and why some folk that we don't think deserve to be there are there. When we experience that, and then God brings heaven down back to this earth as a testament of the journey and the pains we've gone through, then we shall celebrate forever. That's what keeps me going from day to day. In spite of the pains, in spite of the challenges, it's been a rough week for me. I won't lie. And, uh, you know, as a chaplain, I do talk, tend to talk very honestly about some things. You know, you need to slow down on saying what you've, got, what you've gone through. But I am thankful. This time, my crisis in 40 days of prayer did not come at day 21. It actually came after the 40 days on day 41. And I've had to deal with major crises in the course of this week. Um, uh, some of them involve family, so that gets to be very personal. And uh, some of them involve uh, some of my family members, I mean, uh, church family members who are going through a deep crisis even as we speak. I um, uh, did not get home until late in the night. Lord knows when we got home last night. But God is gracious and God is good. And when the shaking and the rattling happens, I have reason to praise God because I know he is doing something that the devil is trying to avoid. Today, we celebrate a un the journey we took together for the first 40 days of the year. 
Today, we celebrate our first communion of the year um, uh, through the Agape Feast. Today, we gather together as a body of Christ. So I'm going to come back to a sermon that I may have shared before, but I want to integrate it back into us today. We're also doing something unique for us this year. Rather than tagging our communion towards the end of the quarter, where we have sometimes so many things going on, and under the pressure to always gather, we put communion in the middle of the quarter. And so it, we don't have the pressure, so we come in, and especially for our ministry leaders, that we can get that moment to be able to enjoy. That's why you may be wondering why my mother asked me, communion in, fe on, in February? I said, yes, it's going to be unique, but uh, it's a moment to get together. The Bible has no prescription as to when we should break bread. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say exactly, it doesn't give us the frequency. So we are going to do that for this year to see how God will do. So this will be our first experience together. And so for that reason and for brevity's sake, I, um, I think... My, I'm inherently a teacher, even though I never went. I did teach a class, was by actually. I taught biology, chemistry, and uh, math uh, at some point in my, one of my lives, <laughs> around my former life. But uh, the Lord does allow me to keep coming back to teach. So sometimes I go deeper rather than going broad and just covering broad gate. So I won't come back and talk about communion, this first communion of the year. Can I do that? Will you allow me to talk about it? Because sometimes... When we do communion, it becomes ritualistic. We just do it just because we do it. But when you ask, when you get out there, you know, I've got grandchildren now, and they keep asking very deep questions. Why? Why do you do communion? And why can't I do what you do? So I have to be forced to go to God to find a way to be able to articulate that so that they can understand. But I also realize for us as a body of Christ, it can become so customary for us that sometimes somewhere down the road, we actually lose the significance. So I want to come back to the bedrock of a message I had shared before regarding communion, and I want to build it in the context of where we are today. Would that be okay? For the next few moments, we want to do that. For those who are online who will not be able to share, partake in our, our agape feast, we will invite you. You're hoping that you still have your communion emblems that you will be able to share as we are sharing. Um, um, I promised our uh, head deaconess that the next communion, we will now have the full range of communion, meaning that we're going to have the ordinance of foot washing that is going to come back. So come prepared the next time as we come to communion that we're going to have the full range of communion as we integrate back into the normal thing of service. Shall we pray together as we begin our message? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for the next few moments. I'm asking you will hide me behind the cross of Christ. Allow your children to focus on you as you deliver this message one more time to your people. May our hearts be lifted towards you. May our cares and our worries be cast aside. And may our characters be shaped in the character of heaven. Attune our ears to you. Take away any distractions and diversions that may come our way and allow us to celebrate in your presence. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I come back to Dante. I've read, uh, well, I did do literature, but I do read a lot. And uh, I come back to Dante Alighieri. He was an Italian poet. He was also a prose writer, a literary theorist a moral philosopher, and a political thinker. He's best known, of course, for his monumental epic titled The Divine Comedy. Why do I bring that? Because church is at a fault right now. And church now is struggling in general, not only to fit in society, but in many places, church is finding herself compromised like in the times of Dante. I'll tell you why I bring back Dante. He lived at a time when religious and political turmoil tore apart much of the Italian landscape. And it caused him to be exiled by Pope Boniface the, the Eighth. In this epic, The Divine Comedy, Dante writes of a man whose journeys from Good Friday evening through Easter Sunday. Through his fictional encounter, 
Dante is able to comment on the religious and political climate of his day. You know, at Sabbath school, we were discussing how to be unique and uh, how, to be <laughs> how to be relevant in this day and age. How do you wean people to Christ with the unique and difficult message that God has given us and yet at the same time be able to incorporate and still stay the unique character that God has given us? In the days of Dante, um, uh, if, if you just came straight out and criticized, not only would the state take you, but the church will take you out. Remember, Dante was in exile because the Pope had exiled him for his criticism of the way things were going. How can we find peace in a morally bankrupt world? In a world where political discourse has lost its civility, where democracy and freedom of speech is deemed to be expressions of a few who will not tolerate dissenting voices. How can we find peace in a world where the moral compass has shifted downwards? In a world where right and wrong is determined by each individual? How can we find peace in an environment where some politicians are calling for their supporters to reload and fight? How can we find peace in an increasingly belligerent political arena where politicians cannot agree to disagree? How can we find peace in an increasingly corrupt society where the word of God is no longer honored? This was the world that Dante himself found himself in. And within this epic, the Divine Comedy, he penned the words, in his will is our peace. In his will is our peace. You see, Dante was profoundly disturbed by the Pope's craving for worldly power. There, was no, there were no spiritual models among the religious leadership of his day. None of the spiritual leaders exercised any kind of restraint on human appetite. The weakness of the empire did not supply the law that was sufficient to exercise any physical restraint on the Pope's appetite or any other will. The Pope's deception had been responsible for Dante's exile and the torching of his home city of Florence. Dante concluded that in his will is our peace. Because all human systems had failed. In his will is our peace. It is the sea into which all things are drawn by him who created all the works of nature. In his will is our peace. We may feel peaceless. We may feel there's a, tum there's a tumult that is going on, just like the earthquake that has now happened in Turkey and Syria. Uh, it was only a 20-second earthquake that has created such carnage. You may feel that your world is just shaking and rattling, and the foundations have given way. How do you function in a world such as this? In his will is our peace. Are you still with me this morning? This is the compass that Dante finds that, he that will help him navigate the secret appetites of men and women who betray, who deceive, who, who deny and destroy all who stand in the way. When I look at Dante's world, I see our world today. I see our cultures and our communities. I see our moral bankruptcy and faithlessness. I see greed and compromise, and I see fear and anxiety. Where can I find peace in God's will? This will be the important theme of our message once again this morning for consideration. In his will is our peace. In his will is our peace. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew, and I'll read for you chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. 
And I want to read from verse 36 to 39. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 39. Let me read again in the New Living Translation. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's sons, two sons, James and John. And he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Matthew signals the end of Jesus' Mount Olivet Discourse. Jesus' destiny with the cross moves inexorably closer. In this chapter, in just two short days, Jesus and his disciples will go to Jerusalem for the final hours of Jesus' earthly ministry. Although Jesus is in control and has knowledge about what is about to transpire, forces of darkness are maneuvering to bring about their desired end. But Jesus stays the course. No matter what your circumstances, I just wanted to pass by this Sabbath morning, let you know. No matter what your circumstances, I want you to know that God is still in control. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 to 30, sets forth Jesus' last supper with his disciples. On that Thursday evening, Jesus, for the first time, indicates that a member of his own inner circle would betray him. The effect on the twelve is traumatic. They are in great distress and deeply grieved. At the table, Jesus will reveal our hidden secrets. This is one of my lessons when it comes to communion. Sometimes we trivialize what communion means. But when we come to the Lord's table, Jesus will reveal our hidden, deep secret. Jesus let them know, one of you here is going to betray me. It created distress, and people were deeply, the disciples were deeply grieved. At the table, Jesus will come clean with your heart. Their reaction indicates violent emotion and even shock. Jesus can read the depths of our hearts. That's why when we come to communion, we prepare in advance that our hearts are clean with God. We're not going to be perfect. Many of us come to communion messed up. Many of us come broken, and God wants us to come that way so he can put us together. I just talked to someone last night in the midst of the crisis that was in the hospital. Someone just came to me and said, I want to talk to you because I want to get back to God. And I thought, man, I don't know if this conversation is going to be functional in the midst of what's happening here. But in the midst of that, there was brokenness going on in the hospital bed. But there was also brokenness in the midst of the family that was going on in the midst of someone who wanted to say, you are the pastor, you are the minister, you baptized me. But I want you to know, since the last time we met, I've broken my relationship with my God. And I want to get back, and I do not know how to get back. As a chaplain, I'm trained to be able to recognize the two spectrums. They've just received news that is not so good. But here, in the midst of that, someone else is collapsing. They're crying out, I need to come to Jesus. So coming to communion, while Jesus sees the secrets of our hearts, he still wants me to come with my emptiness and my brokenness. He still wants me to come as I am. He still wants me to come with my mess. He wants me to bring it to the table. All he wants is that when I come, come clean with 
in you. Come clean with him. Let your heart come clean. Confess where you are with God. Then let him be able to guide you. God will, Jesus will speak to your heart. We may not be open with each other. But as we come to the Lord's table, we better come clean with the Lord. When I spoke to this young person, they felt messed up. They were sexually assaulted. And then they were made to feel that they were the culprit. And it was glossed over by everybody around them that mattered. And subsequently, they felt this that God had pushed them away from them. And right there in the midst of a crisis with all the machines going on and this one patient, there was technically two patients in this room. And I did an anointing, and after I did an anointing, I turned around, and we held hands, and we began to pray, and probably everybody else was crutching their head. What in the world is going on here? But they didn't know that there was a matter of eternal salvation that was happening here. When Jesus says, one of you will betray me, even Judas himself was caught off guard. You see at the communion table, it is a moment of openness and candid honesty with God. I don't know why this young person decided this was the right time, the right moment to actually share with me, this is where I am. And since then, I have gone nowhere but downhill. And the question was, can God accept me where I am with my mess? Come clean with God if you want to be blessed. You see at the communion table, that's why I, I cherish communions, but also it's at communions, right before communions, that I have crises that come my way. I've had personal crises. I've had one time the police threw me out from where I was living because there was a crisis, there was a fight that was going on among the, my hosts. And they were walked in there with their guns. They, you know, you're a black man. You don't want to have uh, law enforcement with their guns drawn out on you. I'm, I'm trying to get hold of the child who has just experienced a traumatic moment as the parents were going at each other. I'm holding the child. And I am being told, you need to get out or else. And I remember that Sabbath morning. It was communion Sabbath. We were <laughs> all dressed as I was, black and white. I'm ready to go do communion. And I remember us driving and driving. This was in California, so it's not a story. It's a real story. We drove and drove that Sabbath until the road came to an end. We found ourselves looking at the ocean. And that's when we spoke for the first time. Oh, we did drive, didn't we? <laughs> we did drive. We had no idea how long we've been driving. But at the communion table, with a traitor gone, Jesus continues the Passover with the rest of the twelve. He dramatically brings the symbolic significance of this meal to its intended fulfillment. Jesus identifies himself with the Passover sacrifice. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Stay with me with Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Jesus says, as they were, the, uh, Matthew says, as they were, we, they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. He says, Take, eat, this is my body. He institutes what is now becomes known as the Lord's Supper. The old meaning of the Passover meal centered on God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian bondage. The new meaning here has to do with God's deliverance from sin through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Communion is a constant reminder of our deliverance from sin. Can somebody say amen out there? There's too much out here to define it. 
There's too much here to throw me out. And yes, I am not that perfect. You know, we talked this morning a little bit about Noah and the Bible said Noah was perfect. But when you look at the word perfect itself, it doesn't mean that it was 100% that it was this, uh, sp- this uh, sp- sp- sparkling clean. I'm mixing my words here. It, it was sparkling clean that he was flawless. No, no, Noah had his own flaws. And we know that because when he descended from that ark, you know, Noah went out planting a vineyard. And you know, you know what went down after that. But, but, but there was something about Noah. Number one, I know with my flaws and my brokenness, God doesn't define me from where I am right now, but God sees how I will be when he's done with me. And he begins to walk with me where I am. He holds me in my brokenness. He takes me with my mess because he sees what I shall become when I walk with him. That's what gives me hope. When I walk down the hallways of church and someone looks at me and says, you are not it. You are not made out to be for this. And I, and I sit there and say, you don't know my experience with my God when I was in that club, when I was trying to take my own life away. And God, Jesus, walked in, tapped my shoulder and said, you are it. And here you are telling me I am not it. We see, sometimes we put labels on people because we see their mess and their brokenness where they are. I pray that our communion service here at Edmondson will be one that will be embracing. We know that you're messed. That's why we have communion every quarter. Because we mess up probably every other quarter. Uh, uh, we, we come in. We're not going to let you stay in your mess. We're going to be clear about that. But we are going to work with you so that God works with you. I expect you to walk one way and your character one way in January. But I sure hope to God by December, you're not the same person that came into church on January 1st. I pray that God has worked with us. Communion is a constant reminder of our deliverance from sin. At the communion table, the traitor of sin must be banished. At the communion table, as we partake of the bread, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. At the communion table, we eat the unleavened bread as a symbolic gesture of the absence of sin. Um, Judas was banished from the table. And now, communion, in communion, we must banish the traitor of sin from the midst of us. So when we take of that bread, it's a symbolic gesture. When I am there, right after communion, Satan, you can't touch me. You can't have a way with me. We have no shares with together. We hold no holdings together. We have no partnership together. I leave clean. That's what the Bible says after communion. They went out singing. You've got to walk out of communion with confidence. You've got to walk out with a smile. You have to walk out of church today with a song in your mouth that you are renewed and God has walked with you. Now your stuff may be waiting for you in your parking lot. Just make sure that God, Jesus, stays close to you so they stay banished. At the communion table, we eat that unleavened bread as a symbolic gesture of the absence of sin. It is here that we have been forgiven. It is here that mercy and grace of Jesus Christ is instituted. Don't ever leave church feeling you are unforgiven. The power to forgive is right here today. And for those of you who are online, by extension, that same power is there today. I come by to let you know when you embrace that, you are forgiven. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. At the communion table, during the Passover, I talked about this before, but I want to talk about it again for brevity. There are four cups that were consumed. I'm sure many of us forgot about those four cups, so let me just come back again for them. The cup of benediction, the cup just before the meal, the third cup of blessing after the meal, or the cup of redemption, and this cup corresponds to God's third promise in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. It said, Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. 
I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. The death of the Passover lamb and the smearing of its blood, blood opened the way for the redemption of God's people. And the fourth cup, following the singing of the hymn, Jesus takes the third cup and says in Matthew 26, verse 27, what does he say? And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to the Lord for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. The shedding of Jesus' blood opens the way for redemption for all humanity to enter into a new covenantal relationship with God. Communion is not just a ritual. Communion gives a poignant promise. Matthew 29, 26, 29 says, Mark my words. This is Jesus from the NLT. He says, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The fourth cup of the Passover was associated with God's promise. Exodus 6, 7 says, I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the oppression in Egypt. I will take you as my own people. These are God's promises. You will live in a world where promises are broken every day. We live in a world where sometimes there is nothing to look forward to. Families, sometimes it's in, even within the family, promises are broken. It used to be if my father gave word, I trusted my father was going to deliver. But Lord, have mercy on me today because even my grandson sometimes will look at me and say, Oh yeah, I'll, I, I, I will trust you when you deliver. Why? Because we live in an environment where every day promises are broken. Their lived experience is not the same as the word of God promises. They, you have to walk with him. And so when, when, my, when my grandson says he, he, he wants to walk a certain pathway, sometimes you have to live it. Even I have to talk to his father sometimes and say, let me just walk with him. Sometimes by just experiencing this, then he will understand what it means. Why? Because God makes a promise. I, you, I, I will claim you as my own people. The question I have for us today, do we believe that we are God's children? So Jesus abstained as an illustration that he will not partake of this cup until his return. Jesus abstains from drinking the fourth cup until his promise in you is fulfilled. So Jesus' words hold out a poignant pr promise that his sacrificial death will bring forgiveness. Jesus' word hold out a sad indication that he will have to go away. But also, Jesus' word brings out an assurance that he will return again. When he comes again and brings the final establishment of the kingdom on earth, he will bring to fulfillment the time of peace and redemption from which, for which we have anticipated for so long. Until then, this Lord's Supper continues to be a perpetual reminder of the new and greater expectation by which we who embrace its significance and historical accomplishment will find release from bondage of sin and deliverance into everlasting uh, into everlasting life. See, my brothers and sisters, you've got to start living like you're living in eternity. 
sometimes we have this uh, disconnected view of life. We live our lives here, and there's a life in heaven. But the Bible does not talk that way. We begin when the Lord holds my hand, I begin to live like as if I'm living with Jesus in heaven. My life ought to be ordered in that way. Meaning, the words that I speak, the things that I say, the way I live my life ought to be in harmony with the principles and tenets of heaven. That I'm in the presence and the perpetual presence of my God. And therefore, I have to choose my words wisely. I have to choose my words carefully. My character has to be in harmony with God's word. People are mean these days. Are you with me this morning? Christians are mean. Can I say that again? Um, uh, 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 there, there's someone else that was going through a crisis. I don't know why this week was a week of crisis for me, but it was a crisis. Someone's going through a deep crisis, and they're trying. They don't have a place. They've been. They've been moved. They are moving from a place because the owner says you've got to go by Tuesday. There is no place to place them. Now I said, well, I may not have big a big space. I'm offering you my space. Now they don't want to bother me, but then there are Christians around who have available spaces that can be used. And they say, you know, there is, there is Airbnb over there and uh, you probably go to a hotel. These are Christians who are fellowshipping with the saints that have the capability and the ability to solve the problem at hand. This is Christianity in the 21st century. There's a certain element of selfishness that has come into, permeated the fabric of our being. But when God touches you and you live in the perpetual covenant of Christ, every day is like in heaven. And in heaven, we're all neighbors. In heaven, we all live in the same zip code. Are you with me this morning? Can I come to your homes and enjoy your homes? <laughs> or do I need an invitation to come by? You know, you're open. To, uh, like uh, my, my, my grandson would say, oh, no, I, I keep telling me I need to teach you full, fluent Spanish. He says, mi casa, su casa. But your house my house is your house. Come to my house. Because in heaven, it will be open. And we can share. But we've got to start living that way here on earth. How kind and how gracious are we? When outsiders walk to this church, what do they experience? When your neighbors see you, what do they know about you and your walk with God? Because we can claim Christianity all we want. But people will experience it by how we live our life. The reason why Jesus got in trouble even with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were <laughs> the church then. They accused him. Eh, you just hang out with all these wallmen, wine beavers, and gluttons. And it's true. Jesus was found always in those social gatherings. But they did not know that while he was there, his character, number one, was did not defined to their character, but there was something amenable about Jesus. Jesus was approachable. Yeah. Jesus was lovable. And even those who were saying, bring out the wine and bring out another wine, another, even if they were out there just having that fun they were having, there was something uniquely different about Jesus. And they were able to sit and to listen. And guess what? That became the foundation of the early Christian church. Amen. Communion is where we are reminded of who we are. When he comes again, and brings the establishment of his final establishment of the kingdom on earth, he will bring to fulfillment the peace and redemption that we have anticipated for so long. To have this communion is to accept his promise. This meal has significance because after the meal, Jesus heads towards Gethsemane. And there in Gethsemane hangs our destiny. And the garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane just simply means the oil press. The oil 
crest. Now you would have to see the oil crest to understand what that really means, how they crushed it. From the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, he has been careful to detail that Jesus fulfills Israel's expectations of the Messiah. Now, as we head towards the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew draws our attention one more time to the Messiah. He must first come to Gethsemane. It is he who must be pinned in such a humiliating way to the cross on Golgotha's hill. This Jesus, who has just come from the Lord's Supper, has baffled his own followers, disappointed the crowds, and enraged the religious leaders. But God is still in control. At Gethsemane, our salvation hangs in the balance. Something troubling happens at the garden. The disciples are told to watch while Jesus prays. Instead, they have fallen asleep. And Jesus, Matthew tells us, that he is overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death. The moment of truth has come. He falls with his face to the ground and he prays in Matthew 26, 39, My father, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. And yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Three times he prayed that the cup may be taken from him. One thing is clear from this experience. Jesus dreads his cup of suffering. Let this cup go. I have mentioned this before. Many scholars have noted the sharp contrast between Jesus Christ's fear of, the, of his impending death on the cross and the reaction of famous, world famous martyrs in history. Most murders, when, when no, knowing that they were right with God, had no fear of death. So what does it mean when Jesus says, let this cup pass from me? Does it mean that he himself was fearing the cross? Uh, that the murders were better than him? No, 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 that's not what it means. Did he love the world too much? Did he lack faith? No, that's not what it means, pastor. What do you mean, preacher? Oh, he, 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 he did he just... Was he just afraid of plain, plain, was he just plain afraid of death? The answer appears to lie in another direction. Can I go there with you for the next few minutes? It had to do with the cup he had to drink. Let me talk about the cup and then I'll bid you goodbye. You see, in the Old Testament, the cup has associations with the wrath or judgment of God. Isaiah 51, 17 says, wake up. Wake up, O Israel, O Jerusalem. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You have drunk the cup of terror, tipping out uh, its, last, its last drop. According to John Scott, Christ's cup symbolized neither the physical pain of being flogged and crucified, nor the mental distress of being despised or rejected, but rather the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world. Christ was about to endure divine judgment which those sins deserved. He was there for you and for me. Satan wanted him to give up. Let this cup go. Give up on you and me. Let go so that we could be condemned to a life with Satan. But Jesus said, it is not my personal will, but your will, my Father. It's almost unbearable to him that he must become a curse for us and become sin in the eyes of God. I hope this helps you understand what was going on at the cross. Jesus didn't just carry that and just say, oh, I just carried it for them. Jesus became sin in the eyes of God for you and for me. He suffered divine retribution. Sin cannot stand in the presence of God, of a holy God. And he had to endure that. And to endure that meant that, and he dreaded this, meant that now at this point in time, 
the fulfillment of what of, of what uh, um, uh, Adam was told that if you eat of this tree, dying you shall die. That word used there for death is not just the death as we know it today. It was actually the eternal separation with God, meaning that you are blotted out from the mind of God like as if you never, ever, ever existed. So when Jesus now comes to the cross and he knows that our lives hang in the balance, he understands what this cup of wrath means. It means that he will become sin for us. And it means in that moment, even though he knows that the Lord, he will resurrect again, in that moment, he will be eternally, at that point in time, he will be separated from God. Something that had never happened before. In the book, Desire of Ages, page 686, Ellen White writes these words. Christ felt that by sin, he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered, shuddered before it. This agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. As a man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. As a man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. In Gethsemane, the moment of decision has come. Jesus must either move forward to the cross or give up his mission. Forces of darkness are prevailing upon him. Satan is by his side pointing pointing out to his closest friends who cannot even stay to support him. One of his disciples at this very moment is on a mission to betray him. And the ungrateful people, the ones that he had called him and laid down their garments and said, Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, these ungrateful people he will soon die for are soon to crucify him. It makes sense to cut his losses and run. But that is not my Jesus. Can you all say amen out there? He never gives up on you and no matter what and how dire your circumstances. So if you feel you are just messed up, you feel you are broken up, and yes, probably we in the church gave up on you a long time ago. I just wanted to pass by this Sabbath morning to let you know Jesus will never give up on you. He's still standing at your Gethsemane. While the cup hangs in the balance, he chooses to go forward just for you. He never gives up on you, no matter how dire your circumstances. In the agony, a decision is finally made. His decision is to go to the cross irrevocably. He, he, he will not turn back. He will not let this cup go. So Gethsemane. At Gethsemane, you have to come alone. Jesus came with some friends to pray. They could not watch even for a moment with him. But Matthew lets us know that sometimes at Gethsemane, we have to come to the garden alone. Chambers of prayer demand some alone time. That's why I say 40 days of prayer is over. We came collectively. I pray that you are not going to stop praying. That you will find, you'll be intentional to find pockets of serious prayer. I'm not just talking of fly by, pass by prayer. I'm talking that you find time to have serious conversation with God. Because your powerful encounter with God in your closet of prayer, my powerful encounter with God in my closet of prayer, our collective power of prayer together in our closets of prayer, when we gather in this house, it becomes a powerhouse. It becomes a place where the walls will shake because it cannot be contained because of the power of God when we pray together. So we must come to Gethsemane. Just you and God. At Gethsemane, we have to let God's will rule of our lives. I just want you to know this. There is no victory at the cross without victory at Gethsemane. Can I say that again? There is no victory at the cross without victory at Gethsemane. We've got to pray, church. Whatever happened, 
to our prayer bags. We've got to pray. When we call for prayer, we all should be lining up, waiting for that Zoom to open so we can pray. When men call a call for prayer just to pray, we all should be showing up there, not just by ourselves, but inviting all our other brothers that there's some prayer going on somewhere. When the ladies call out to pray, we should have our neighbors and friends asking, when is that prayer happening again? But that's not the case. Because we can barely get people to prayer. Thank God for Zoom. <laughs> that, we have, that we have prayer meeting on Zoom. Because when we used to have prayer meeting here in person, <laughs> I'll drive two hours to come to prayer meeting. And only seven, eight, nine of us. I'll come again if we have to come. I'll drive three hours to go for prayer. Well, there's something we need to look about prayer. That's what I want to remind us today as we come to our communion service. We will not succeed in our spiritual lives until we have genuinely began to pray. Victory will come when we stop deception and duplicity. Victory at Gethsemane will come when we give up our personal agendas and allow God to guide our lives. At Gethsemane, you must face the forces of evil alone. I told you this week, I've got to stop stories because I need to finish in three minutes here. Uh, but, I, but I was in the hospital, we were busy praying, and this is the same family that I was praying for in the course of the week. And the neighbor was out there listening to the prayer. The, the, the roommate was there listening to prayer. And so when I'm told that when I was gone, they asked, next time you all have prayer, can you all just pull the curtain so that I can be part of this prayer? No one thought that they were listening. But they knew something was happening in this situation. This individual almost lost their life. This family, this week. The whole crisis team was invited. I was in, a, I was in a, my own patient meetings and I got this urgent call and I had to, got off and uh, it was like a chain um, uh, conference call. We all like co super connected. I'm connected to the hospital through like three people in the conference, in the line. And we all say, Pastor, in the midst of the doctors doing this, we need you to pray now. And that's why I told you, you've got to be ready at all times. You never know when you'll be called upon. So you have to have your victory at Gethsemane. Because when you are called in a life and death situation, what do you do? It's not time to ask God, am I right for this moment? You've got to step up to the moment with confidence. You've got to pray with confidence. You've got to ask God, intervene in this moment. You've got to know if God is saying, this one shall live. So when you speak life... Speak life with confidence. God will be able to restore. God will be able to hold. I'm glad to say that when I went back, they weren't able to talk. But when we were there with my wife last night, we were able, they were conversing. We had an anointing service yesterday. And when, when the other pastor came, they were there just quiet, just looking, looking over. When we finished praying, I tapped them and said, well, my friend, may God be with you. They opened up and smiled. And everybody was shocked for the first time in seven days, they actually smiled. And they began to speak some words they hadn't spoken for a whole week. And I'll tell you about prayer. It makes me emotional because I know the power of prayer. It is prayer that will keep you alive. But beyond keeping you alive, God wants to use you more than just being about your personal prayer. God wants to use you as a vessel. When people walk in this church, we don't do dramatic stuff, but when people walk in this church, can we pray and they can walk away and say, I felt something about that prayer. I'm touched. Can we pray for heaven to just move things around so that we can be able to do the work that God has? I'm praying and I continue to pray. With a lot of challenges. Some of them have been carried forward for many years. Are you all with me? 
I told, can I tell you my conversation with my God? I talk to my God and I say, I have young people that I need to come to church. I need, there are children. I need to have children's church running every Sabbath. Now I'm not, Lord, I'm not asking for one child. I'm not asking for two children. I'm asking for 100 children to be able to worship. Y'all, y'all went quiet on me. So what did I tell the Lord? I have the education wing over there, Lord. We've had carried over those problems in there for many years. Long before my predecessor was here, those problems were still here. I told the Lord, no, not anymore. This year, I said, Lord, not anymore. Whatever is needed, Lord, we are going to mitigate this problem that we have in the education wing so that when my new pie finders come by, when our new adventurers come by, when our VBS comes by, there is a place where we can place our children and be able to worship. Do you all believe that with me? Can you all go to the chambers of prayer? How much will it cost? It's not a question of how much. I've been in situations where money is never the issue. Let me just tell you. We fight over pennies and uh, pennies and dimes. But I'll tell you as a servant of the living God, I've been on mission trips as a student who makes nothing. We want to go to South Sudan. How much do we need? Lord, we need to raise 150000 in six weeks. How in the world are we going to get 150000 I will tell you by the time we got on the plane in Atlanta to head on to Nairobi, Kenya, and then to Lokichogyo, northern Kenya, and then into South Sudan, we had the $150,000 to accomplish God's mission. Money is never the issue. If it takes 100000 to be able to bring this facility to where we can do ministry for our children, is God constrained by $100,000? The last time I checked Psalm 24 verse 1, it says that the, 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 the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. The silver and the gold belongs to God. But sometimes our faith gets in the way. Now my treasurer has got to do the numbers. So you provide the numbers for my treasurer to do. My treasurer and my finance team has to look at what we have. This not them, but we as a church. I told the Lord no more. This year, we resolve this problem. This year, we've got this personage problem lingering over here. Lord, we are resolving this problem. Who's going with me by faith on this thing? Well, which, which also means that we may come for your pockets as well. Your sacrifices as well. It may mean that. But I don't know how God is going to do it. But I said, Lord, this year, in the midst of these 40 days of prayer, that's what I'm asking. The Lord is able to work with us. So at Gethsemane, you must tell God, not my will, but yours. God may not give me a million dollars for my bank. I would love to have that, but he probably is not going to give me that. But God, if I come and ask him, I need that million dollars to discharge a task he has given me, he will provide that for me. He has provided that. At Gethsemane, the night seems long. At Gethsemane, the thunder clouds roll in the horizon. But at Gethsemane, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his hands. It is with humility at Gethsemane that our prayers are answered. At Gethsemane, look through the shattered windows of your life. Look at your broken dreams. Acknowledge your failures. Claim the promises of God. At Gethsemane, rise up to the calling of being a true child of God. At Gethsemane, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. I invite you this Sabbath morning to Gethsemane. As we come to the conclusion of our service, and go on to take, to take our, our agape feast together. Today is a celebration. The agape feast is a celebration. We've come through 40 days of prayer together. We wanted to celebrate today. We're going to celebrate. For those of you who are online, um, uh, since you're not able to join us physically, we, hope, we pray that you have your communion emblems and you'll be able to journey with us through this moment.
So I invite you to get seven, to partake in the communion of love. Participate in the sacrifice and resurrection of our risen Savior. Think about how good God has been to you. Let go of everything that you brought with you. Open your heart. Receive the grace and mercy of Jesus. Invite him to your heart. Let him walk with you through your desert today. Then slowly give everything to him. Let go of the stress. Let go of the hatred. Let go of the gossip. Let go of those secret sins. Invite Jesus into your heart. Invite joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. As you come to this feast today, I want you to know that the institution of the Lord's Supper gives us a crucial experience of God's will for us individually and corporately. It is not simply a religious exercise, but a schematic of our lives. During communion, we look backwards. The Lord's Supper points back to Jesus' historical accomplishment of salvation as a finished act. By looking back, we are prompted to rest in the finished work of salvation on the cross and give thanks as we consider Jesus' body and blood expended for us. We look forward. We look forward during communion to the time we will enjoy the consummation of the kingdom of God and enjoy fellowship with Jesus in the drinking of the cup anew together with him. We look forward with confidence each new day with a conviction that our future is secure with him whether we live or we die. We also look inward. The celebration of communion is also an important time of self-examination. Communion times can be important occasions to look inwardly at our hearts and holding uh, one's oneself personally accountable before God. Remember I told you, there is no victory at the cross without victory at Gethsemane. That is inward. You've got to come to that inward. We also look upward. The Lord's Supper looks upward as we remember Jesus' death on the cross. The brutal, uh, the burial in the tomb is not the end of the story. His resurrection is the sure declaration that his death is still efficacious. We look up with conviction and joy, knowing that our Savior lives and is seated at the right hand of the Father. We also look around. Communion is also a time to emphasize the corporate nature of the Lord's Supper. We cannot have the Lord's Supper by ourselves in our homes in the absence of the community of faith. Now, I know we'd, we've been doing that through COVID, we're going to start redefining that so that uh, we're able to have that corporate um, uh, gathering together to celebrate together. For a moment, we're transitioning slowly as we give ourselves time about that. The community washes feet and shares in the, bra uh, the bread and the wine. Without community, we fail alone. Jesus' disciples needed, need each other to help them to stay faithful times of communion are powerful opportunities to renew our service to each other in the body of Christ. And then finally, we look outward. The corporate nature of communion points to the outward dimension of the Lord's Supper. The institution of the meal proclaims that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The world is dying without the message of the good news that Jesus has provided salvation from sin through his death on the cross. As we renew our common commitment to that message, we are renewed individually to walk with the risen Savior in a world that waits to hear our personal.
testing. That is my invitation for you today. May the Lord bless you as we partake of the agape feast today. I hope today you walk with a new dimension of what it means to come to communion. And I pray that your prayers will be just as powerful. Your experience with God will just be as powerful. Shall we pray together? Our Father, thank you for reminding us the essence of communion. We're not perfect. You not call us as, as uh, to be to come in perfect, but you call us as we are, so that you can reshape us, and you can guide us to make us perfect. I pray a special blessing for us today, as we continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper, that all of us will experience the joy of the true meaning of salvation. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.